Okay. Hi. Hey, we're back. Oh my gosh. I am so sorry, everyone. Um, thank you for all of the, the participants who have patiently been trying to connect to this. Um, I uh, do apologize. Um, I've really never um, kind of had that um, before, but um, everyone seems to be getting back on now. So that's um, something. Um, I think that um, given that we have um, had that little technical um, difficulty, I'm going to dispense with a lot of my introductory, um, you know, nonsense. Um, thank you, everyone who um, is joining us this evening. This is um, Special Education Legal Fund and our second webinar of the year. Um, you know, what is an IEE? Um, and we're really excited to have our distinguished panelists join us tonight. Um, first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, our featured sponsor, American School for the Deaf um, out of West Hartford. Um, we are really thrilled and honored um, for all of our sponsors um, that have chosen to support this parent education program series in our second um, year of this program. Um, Winston Preparatory School and Wealth Spire Advisors at the Gold Level, the Silver Level, American School for the Deaf, Chapel Haven, Shrub Oak International School, Villa Maria, and Fusion Academy. And at the Bronze Level, we have as sponsors Eagle Hill School and the Windward School. So thank you to all of our sponsors and friends. Um, before we start, um, I just want to say a couple words. Um, Special Education Legal Fund is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2018 to provide resources to families in need in Connecticut and Westchester County, New York. And we do that through our grants program, which of which we run two. We run a legal assistance program for people that need attorneys and an advocacy support program for families that need advocates. Both of those programs are now open. We are now accepting grants for both of those programs. Um, we run on a monthly basis, which means we review all of the applications that we receive in a given month during that month and render a decision for applicants at, by the end of the month. So if you are interested in this program, please visit us on our website, which is www.spedlegalfund.org. I will put that in the chat when we are, um, you know, when, when I'm able to do so. Um, normally it would be on screen right now, but because of the technical difficulties, I don't wanna do anything that is gonna mess with um, the fragile balance that we have right now. So um, we're accepting applications now. You have to complete a pre-screening. You'll get an application, you do a phone interview, and, all of, and you get notified by the end of the month. So that is true for both programs. Um, so we're really excited um, to share that with you um, this evening. Um, and so um, next, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to our next webinar, which is happening on October 26th, um, which is about a month from today. Um, same Wednesday, you know, same time, same, you know, general channel. Um, seven o'clock and that webinar is going to be co-sponsored with Wealthspire Advisors and we're going to talk about special needs planning for children, schools, trusts and beyond. Um, we're so pleased to welcome from Wealthspire Advisors Rich Yam and our moderator Michael Delgas as well as Marion Walsh um, from Littman Crooks and Adrian Arkontaki from Cuddy Law. So we're really, really excited. You can register for that through the same channel that you did to, um, to get onto this um, you know, fine, um, fine webinar programming this evening. Um, so I'm gonna run through some really quick introductions with respect to everyone's time. So pleased to have Dr. Adrienne Smaller back. Um, you know, we love um, Dr. Smaller. She is um, someone for whom I could not have imagined getting through personally um, the last um, you know 15 years of you know my son's experience without Dr. Smaller's advice and support. So I'm really pleased to have you back um, for your second or third or whatever it is. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so Dr. Smaller, um, and then um, Julie Swanson, AKA the life skills lady, is joining us this evening. Um, you know, we were just. Uh, is this your third or fourth time? I'm not sure. Um, Julie is really a treasure um, as a special education advocate, as a mom, as someone who has walked this path herself, and who's really been active in, um, you know, and really bringing awareness to um, all of the different pieces of making sure that our children with autism, who become adults with autism, you know, have all the skills they need to live a full and independent life. I hope I'm summarizing that, you know, Beautiful. kind of mission of yours. Um, Thank you for having me. We're, I'm, we're delighted to have you. 
And next, um, to our new, our two newcomers, really, actually, um, you know, um, attorney, um, special education attorney Penelope Petzold. Um, Penny is a tremendous resource. I have been so, so pleased and, and blessed to be able to work with you on, you know, several cases in the last, you know, um, couple of years. And, um, and really, um, you know, delighted to welcome you to the, you know, the self um, webinar family. So we're so excited to have you. And um, so welcome, Penny. And um, last but not least, um, we would, we're so excited to welcome Melissa Gagne, who is partner at Laviano and Gagne with um, Jennifer Laviano, another one of our um, favorite people. Um, and we're super excited. It's also Melissa's first time. Melissa is also a, um, a warrior mom who came to this, um, this field, you know, as so many of us do, um, through her own personal experience with her son. And um, we're super pleased to have um, Melissa on with us this evening. So um, I blew through all that really quickly. And the last thing I'm going to say, um, because it wouldn't be a um, legal webinar panel without a disclaimer, um, so I'm going to do that now. Um, this webinar panel is presented for informational purposes only. This webinar is intended as a resource for families who are navigating the special education system in Connecticut or New York and is not intended to provide legal support, advice, or assistance to any particular individual, nor is it intended to replace the advice and counsel of a qualified special education attorney. This webinar should not be construed as an endorsement by Special Education Legal Fund or any of its representatives of any of the participating attorneys or advocates in the panel. Um, for webinar participants, you should view this panel as a public forum. Please do not ask questions about your child or your child's legal or educational situation in this forum. Please email any questions you have to me. I will put my email in the chat in a second. And also please refrain from any comments that include identifiable information about your child, including name, grade, school, or school district. Please remember at all times that your screen name may be visible to not only the participants in the panel, but the panel, the participants in general, and will be visible to us. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, in theory and may be distributed and shown at a later date um, at the discretion of Special Education Legal Fund. So um, thank you everyone for, for hanging in there um, with us. Um, and I'm really, really pleased to start, um, what is an IEE? So I'm gonna start this off by, um, with a definition. You know, can you all please identify or define independent education evaluation, independent educational evaluation, each individual word for me? Anyone can start. I'm not gonna call on people. I said I wouldn't. Okay, um, I can start. Yeah. You start, Melissa. Okay, so independent education evaluation um, is an evaluation conducted by a qualified examiner who is not employed by the school district um, that's responsible for the child's education. Um, and so I know that people are confused sometimes um, you know, my own clients ask me sometimes about the educational part of independent, you know, independent educational evaluation. So the independent part is someone who is not employed by your school district. Educational, I, I think it's really important uh, to clarify that that doesn't mean just academic. Um, so you're not just uh, evaluating a child's academic performance. You're evaluating um, it can include related services, speech evaluations, it can include occupational therapy evaluations, it can include um, all of those related services. So it's not specific just to uh, an academic uh, evaluation. So when you're thinking educational, think, you know, you know, think broader, think of the scope of special education, right? Um, and then evaluation. That's perfect. And I mean, I free think and clear of any input from anyone in the school district, I would add. That's the independent piece. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and a person who is contracted, who does typical work, oh, we have someone on contract, that is not an independent evaluation. That person is technically an employee of the school. So that well, would not count. 
And to that point, you know, sometimes the school districts will hand you a list. Here are some people yep. you could choose from. And you can kindly say, oh, I'll absolutely consider those, but I'd also like to consider some of my own folks. Mm -hmm. You're not obligated to choose those people. Therefore, it wouldn't truly be independent if you were forced to just choose someone from a, a you know, a, a finite list. That's absolutely correct. And that kind of follows on with the conversation that we were having before, you know, we started the webinar was this really like what you know, truly constitutes independence, you know, in an evaluator. And what should you as a parent be looking for? Because I know, you know, I mean, the IEE is, is like the most important thing that parents have as a tool or one of the most important things. And you can't get anything without it. You know, it is, you know, this, um, you know, in your arsenal, it is like a, a really, really important tool. And um, so, but, you know, our understanding of it, you know, can sometimes be, um, you know, not as, you know, not as good, you know, as we might want it to be. Who are these people? Who are the best people to, to do the evaluation, you know, for my child? Who's the best person in any individual category? Um, how, how do you, um, as, you know, as advocates, as, you know, attorneys, you know, as, you know, you know, I mean, this one isn't really for you, Dr. Smaller, but, you know, how do you help families find the right person to do the particular evaluation that their child needs when you get to this point? Well, I'll hop in here and two comments I have. And one is, um, I always like to say to parents that an evaluation is worth a piece of paper if it's, it's written on if it doesn't have prescriptive recommendations. Mm -hmm. And we as advocates and attorneys are, are only as good as the advice and the recommendations that are embedded in that evaluation because we are not the people who can say, your child needs X, Y, and Z. Certainly we can have an opinion, but nobody's obligated to listen to what we think. So people like Dr. Smaller, um, when they write their evaluation, we have to hang on to every single word she's saying and use what she's recommending to then request what the child needs. Um, but as far as um, answering the first part of your question, and I'm sure the other panels have an answer for this as well. Um, you know, when you've been doing this for a very long time, you sort of know all the players in the state. And it really just comes down to experience and knowing who's who and the reputations and and you know what kind of evaluations they 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 are able to um, put forth. Would you all agree? Totally. And and I was I was thinking, you know, if I haven't heard of someone, I'll reach out to my colleagues and yes. say, hey, have you guys ever heard of this person? And yeah. sometimes I'll get, oh yeah, fabulous. Mm -hmm. Especially if you know if it's someone new that that we not heard of, or it just right. comes up. Um, sometimes you'll hear, well, I had a meeting and it wasn't great. Um, but each evaluator is as different as each evaluation. So you you know, um, and it depends on on what the parent is comfortable with. I would say that um, going back to your question about evaluation, educational evaluations, that I would make it very clear that, that we're not looking for the medical piece. Mm -hmm. And um, very often, if you're looking at an evaluation that will be covered by insurance, you're going to get more medical than academic um, pieces. And that's, that's why, because um these let's let's educational evaluations okay i want to go table the, i want to table the medical evaluation for a minute just because um you know someone came into the chat and wanted to ask about what a qualified examiner is which was a thread that we were on a minute and maybe dr smaller you can you can address that question and then we can kind of go into those those different pieces of like what particular evaluations are sorry penny no no that's fine i like this <laughs> Um, so, um, well, the, I look at and, and when, when somebody calls me, uh, whether it's a school district or a parent requesting an IEE, I look at it as a second opinion, as a new set of eyes, um, looking at the child, assessing the family, as well as the child, as well as the educational program. Um, and in terms of, uh, qualifications, 
Um, I have to say each district is very, you know, the state has certain guidelines and then each district has their own guidelines. So um, in terms of being selected or asked to do an evaluation, sometimes I just get a quick email from a director and said, that says a parent has requested you to do this evaluation. Uh, what's your availability? Um, I, I send a contract to them, they sign it, and then I never hear from them until the PPT. Um, so that's one way. And those are usually people that know me quite well. Um, and there are other districts that I get eight pages of what they consider uh, an evaluator's you know, criteria and what I'm supposed to be meeting. And that could be anywhere from submitting my CV to my license to the face sheet of my malpractice insurance. And one district required fingerprints. So um, it's sort of a range. Um, and, um, and I said no to the fingerprints um, because I feel like if I'm licensed by the state of Connecticut and I have malpractice insurance and that has to be right. renewed every year, then maybe I, I don't need to have finger, I shouldn't have to be well, fingerprinted. You know, <laughs> that brings up a really good point, Dr. Smaller. And so the state has criteria. And often when you say districts have their own criteria, you have to know that some of that criteria may not be in keeping with what the state says it has to be. So you have to be very careful. And so when it asks for fingerprints, but they don't ask that of their own evaluators who are in their district, that goes above and beyond what they should be asking you to do. So you have to be really savvy about looking at what the criteria is to make sure that it's not overly burdensome and uneven with what they should be asking of you. Absolutely. One district asks for everyone in my practice to submit um, their uh, malpractice and so forth. And, and that's my husband and my office manager. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> You'll have to get somebody else. So um, so I feel like that is burdensome. Um, and um, deliberately and so, who knows? Kind of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. kind of insulting. So, um, so again, there's a range. And again, I think that a lot of it is to, you know, sort of, there aren't a lot of districts that would want me as an IEEE uh, evaluator. Um, and, um, and it's a way of sort of, um, you know, exerting some control as well. Over so, um, so you, you can only pick and choose, you know, those districts that are welcoming. And, um, and I make it very clear that, um, you know, the it's an independent evaluation. And I feel that I'm the child's advocate. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter who's paying me. Um, but I really it I'm writing it um, in the best interest of the child. I, I have a question for you, Dr. Smaller. I mean, in terms of, you know, and we're going to get into this and go back to, you know, to Penny's, um, you know, um, comment from before about the, a medical evaluation, um, you know, but when you're thinking about, you know, who's paying for the evaluation, so there's different types of evaluations, obviously. Um, there are, you know, there's this independent educational evaluation that is paid for by the district, um, in theory, independent. There is a private um, evaluation, um, you know, which in Connecticut, I guess it's called a pipe or used to be called a parent initiated private evaluation paid for by the parent. Um, there's a medical evaluation, which, you know, Penny has, uh, started to talk about before, before I so rudely interjected. Um, can, can we talk about the differences between those evaluations and, you know, um, not just like, you know, who's paying for them, but, you know, is there, is there a difference in the report that comes out at the end of the day between there, the three of those? Well, there's definitely a, a difference in the report that you're going to get ver in a medical versus an educational evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, I just got a couple and it was all the recommendations were for what the parents should do, first of all. There were no recommendations for the school. Mm -hmm. um, it started out by saying um, that they were looking more at what um, what the, the medical impact was, and that didn't help us at all because that the school district would turn around and say, well, it, it's he's clearly not an educational impact. Mm -hmm. um, 
So um, I know that those are very different. Um, I think the, the difference between an IAE and a pipe, there shouldn't be, theoretically, there shouldn't be any difference because either way, the district has to consider them. They have to treat them as if they are outside evaluations that they just need to consider, which truly means they just need to ask some questions about it and talk about it at a PPT. They can hold it like a diseased piece of paper, <laughs> but it, they have considered it. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have to take all the recommendations. Um, and um, I mean, Melissa, Julie, where, what, what else? What, uh, we were asking the difference between a medical and an educational. Well, well no, first of all, a pipe what, and, a, and a pipe and an the, IEE also, you know. Yeah, I, what do you but, think is the big difference between an IEE and a, and a, and a parent initiated um, evaluation? Is there, do you well, see- I agree much? with you, there should be no, there should be no difference. Yeah. Right. In yeah. fact, if a parent initiates it and pays for it, and then they request yeah. um, that right. they're reimbursed for it, that's considered, you know, that they're asking for an IEE. Right. Do the, the, the one do thing they, about they that- wait to, so, the, to the IEE versus the pipe, or do they look at them both equally? They're supposed to look at them equally. But the, the one thing about a pipe is if it doesn't come out great, if you're not happy with it, you don't have to share it with the district. Well, that's true. Absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely. mean, yes, you've lost that money, but you know, you it's sometimes better to yeah. have have that uh of sure. not have the bad evaluation in your child's file. Right. That's which, true. Can I just tell you in all the years I've been advocating, I've never heard of pipe. So if, I'm sorry. I've never heard like, of it either. It's I not a legal know. acronym. So just to, it's just just to clarify, it's, like, not, yeah, sorry, it's not a legal no. acronym like IEE is. Yeah. No, I, I, I kind of figured that. I just, it's throwing <laughs> me. I just made it up. I just made okay. it up on the fly. Okay. Um, my but attorney. It works. Used it's that. great. Yeah. No, my attorney used to use that, um, you know, back okay. in the day. Um, and, um, you know, and as a way to distinguish between, you know, the, the two, yeah. you know, the two sort of things. And, um, and I was like, you know, it just like, it kind of, you know, kind of works, but, um, you know, it's memorable. We, just, we would just say it's a private evaluation, private evaluation. funded by the parents. Right. Do, um, but I mean, I think it's important, you know, for, for everyone to recognize that, you know, all of these things should be fungible, you know, no matter who pays for them. I mean, you know, the medical evaluation being a, a different thing. Um, you know, these are all, you know, should be um, tools that we use to, um, you know, that that schools and parents can use to, you know, determine, you know, the right path forward um, for a child. You know, it's kind of like a map. It's a roadmap to the to the child, you know, and it's what you use to develop the IEP going forward. Um, well, you also, I mean, it, the the basis of it is to determine eligibility. I mean, that's that's the whole point of right. the triennials and the and it should do we need to determine if the child is continues to be eligible for special education. Uh, but yeah, and, it, and for programming and planning. And obviously, yeah. yeah. Yep. I just didn't want people to think that's the only reason for the evaluation. Oh, it's thank you. Yep. Okay. <laughs> No, it's absolutely important. And it's, it, but it's one of those things, you know, that, you know, I have a lot of parents that come to, you know, to self and they are, you know, they come to us and they say, you know, my child needs an outplacement. I, my, I, I'd like an outplacement for my child. And what sometimes it's hard to, um, you know, to, you know, and that's obviously the topic of a whole other, you know, webinar, but um, what sometimes, you know, parents don't know is that the, um, you know, the evaluation is like the critical, you know, linchpin in that process. You know, if one wishes to go down that road, you know, you one must have an expert opinion recommending the road that you want to take. And so it's really important to, you know, follow this procedure, whether or not, you know, your evaluation is privately paid for, or if you go through the IEE process after the school evaluation is done, like all of these steps need to be followed in order to get, you know, to, to reach your ultimate goal, you know, of outplacement. So I think that that's, 
um, an important thing to, um, you know, to, to talk about. Um, so Christine, I just, can I say something yeah, just absolutely. to that point as a mom, um, you know, my experience as a mom with my son, he's now 26, but, um, and he is, you know, profound, you know, profoundly autistic, um, but when he back when he was five and six and seven years old and he was in still in the public schools and had two one to one paraprofessionals just for him and I got called every day to pick him up that you know the school recommended the district recommended a, a neuropsych and again this is something that we spoke of before and the 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 provider who who conducted the neuropsych did not observe him uh, in the school setting, only observed him in his office setting, and the report read like a, a child I didn't recognize. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have counsel at the time, I didn't have an attorney, and I disagreed with the evaluation. And, you know, at the time I was I was understanding that he was going to need something different um, than the other than the public school setting. Um, and even without really understanding how important this evaluation was, I, I just said, this can't be, this isn't my child. We need to get something more specific, more accurate. And I was actually handed a list by the school district that said, okay, well, then, you know, you can choose from one of these people, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we'll do a second evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and this is again, before I knew, yeah. you know, really what the law was, I thought that just can't be right. right. And this doesn't that, seem right. Yeah. It isn't right. And that is actually what led me to call an attorney for the first time, a special education attorney for the first time, because it just didn't feel right. And, and so I just offer that anecdote because I think a lot of times, you know, parents have such strong instincts, their instincts are just, you know, they're, they know they're, you know, your child better than That's anybody. That's a great point. They and know and, when something's wrong. And you have a child who's as severe as my son was, who was sort of thrown out of every program we, we tried to place him in, um, and to not look at him in the school setting as an evaluator, um, to me was just, I, I, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't, I, I, it was something I just couldn't get past. So um, I just think it's really important to follow when you have those instincts as a parent and you read those, an evaluation that the school district does and you think this, you know, this yeah. isn't right. Because a lot of times parents will ask, you know, well, sh should I request what, you know, when should I request mm -hmm. uh, an independent evaluation? And, and sometimes it's when you read those, those reports and you say, uh, you know, this isn't my child. I, I don't even recognize, you know. Yeah. You know, the, I think that's the best time to request the interview. Yeah. That's because, um, and I wanted to make sure that we touched on this, a school district can ask you why you disagree, but you don't have to tell them. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not, you, you're a parent, you don't have to know why you right. disagree. You're not an educational expert. Right. Um, you know, you just, this just doesn't sound like my child. Yeah. And that's what good. What the district asks you, what tests you want to have done. Mm -hmm. I find that's a like kind of a loaded, you know, question. Um, you know, like when you, you send that email, right? You've worked on your email, you write, I would like to request, you know, a, you know, a full neuropsych evaluation for my child, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then you get the email back that says, oh, okay, what testing are you looking for exactly? Please list what testing. How are you as a parent supposed to know? Like what's, what's the appropriate response to that email? It, honestly, and it, I, I've had I've had to write these emails quite often, or people ask it right in the meeting. And I'll say, well, part of the reason we're asking for an independent educational evaluation is we need the expert to tell us what kind of assessments need to yeah. be done. Um, if I were a neuropsychologist, I'd be able to answer that question. Right. If I knew the child, I'd be able to answer that question. You know, to, that intimately. Right. Um, it, it's kind of a trick question. It is totally a trick question. Can you it's say I want his right. behavior assessed? I want his emotional regulation assessed. Do I want his adaptive skills assessed? Sure, right. but to know what Specific all the tests, tests are done is like there's no way you know right I, I have i have a book of over 300 testing different tests that can be implemented in special ed so there i mean for a parent to be able to say oh i want the c top over the tools right that's that's not reasonable and it's putting them in an un, unfair situation right absolutely yeah. absolutely also i should say that a lot of times uh, districts will ask me 
well, what test? And I, I'll say, I don't know who this child is. Yeah, yeah. I don't have the record. Hey, yeah. I haven't been in the room with them. Um, yeah. Usually, um, you know, I have sort of a general idea, but the battery is formed by the referral question, by being in the room with right. a child. But, you know, one test could lead to another. Mm -hmm. um, but districts will ask me, what, what test would you use? And it's like, I have no idea. So from now on, Dr. Smaller, I'm going to say, Dr. Smaller can't even answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer, if I were a neuropsychologist, I could answer your question, you know, but I'm not. That's going to be my response, which I- which I, I like that a lot. <laughs> Always learn something from Julie. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I have a question out of the um, the chat, um, which I thought was interesting and kind of um, you know is a follow on to a lot of what we're discussing. Um, I told you this was going to be free flowing. Um, the The question is: Doesn't the Department of Education place a cap on the cost of an IEE and have recommended providers that accept that amount? And then if you really want to use your own and the Department of Ed refuses um, or the school refuses the higher cost, then you end up at an impartial hearing or possibly mediation. Melissa, I'm going to let you take this one. I, I have an opinion. I have I, I research I have I did years ago. <laughs> oh, you have a go ahead, Adrian. What's your experience? So, um, so um, there are a lot of districts that will cap it um, and um, and you know, if it doesn't meet my fee, I just can't do it. It's so labor intensive um, and um, requires, um, you know, so much work. And and I, you know, I don't. But they will uh, cap an evaluation. I think it depends on the district. So I don't think it's the statewide um, requirement in terms of um, what's required. But um, there has been a case uh, recently where uh, the parents did request uh, an independent, um, an IEE after receiving the school's evaluation. And they were, just because they requested it, um, they were denied and they were told that they would have to go to due process. Sure. So that, I've never heard of that. In oh, you've never heard, that's the law, yeah, that's, yeah. that's but the right. the cost cannot, from what I understand, the cost cannot be an average. Like they can't take all of them and average it, mm -hmm. um, because there are some specific. Right. There are some kids. There's a, a friend of mine whose daughter needed has such a rare genetic um, anomaly that she had to get an evaluation all the way out in Illinois, mm -hmm. and that was an independent evaluation because that was the only place where right. she could get it. Right. So, well, you know, the, the cost, I, I, I have a problem with the, the cost because I think federally they don't say that, they, federally right. they, I there's think it's reasonable no and customary. Is it like a, um, that it should be reasonable and customary? In other words, what, um, no? No, <laughs> I, I thought it was just, I thought the, the feds had said really, you know, as long as the the evaluator meets district criteria, and the criteria being what the district um, expects of their own people as far as qualifications, that that was it. Yeah. Um, My I, understanding over the last few years is that this IEE criteria went out from the state, and then all of the towns made their own, and some of the some of the criteria overreached. Oh, yeah. what it should have been. And so that's very often when in some of the cases that I've had to work on where we've had to get in touch with the district and say, look, we disagree with your criteria. Mm -hmm. You know, this is overly burdensome and no, and, and you sometimes have to fight it. Mm -hmm. You might have to call the state. You might have to, you know, put a letter in writing and saying, you know, please provide us with the written authority to support that, that where, where you're getting this information and you have to fight it sometimes. And, um, you know, certainly I think districts are, are trying to make sure that the, that IEEs don't cost them so much money that get, it gets so extravagant, but it also has, to, there is criteria put out by the state that, um, you know, that, what am I trying to say? They'll compare it to like, let's say a, a Dr. Smaller charges something and the person in the town next to her charges 4,000 extra. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to come up with um, what could be 
considered um, reasonable. reasonable, yeah, I think normal, reasonable. like a, yeah. a baseline kind of kind right. of right. But yeah. I but at the end of the day, you're entitled to a free, appropriate, yeah, public education at no expense to you, and not even the evaluation. So if you really wanted to fight it, I suppose you could. I don't know if there's any case law. Um, about this yet with parents fighting IE IEE IE criteria in Connecticut? I don't know. Well, it's interesting because the criteria question brings up something that Dr. Smaller and I have talked about, you know, at a, you know, at another time, um, which is, you know, like what is professional criteria? Because don't some of them say, you know, the evaluation must be done by, you know, a neuropsychologist? And, you know, Dr. Smaller, as we, you know, is, you know, Dr. Smaller graduated at a time when um, that was not an, you know, like that's, that's not a degree that was available, you know, so you know, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Um, so I, I feel like um, the neuropsychologist, uh, you know, a neuropsych is sort of synonymous with an, an IEE. Um, and it's really, you know, that's really not, not. what it is. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, clinical psychologists, um, and it depends on training, it depends on school experience, um, and, um, and they didn't have neuropsychology when I trained. Right. Now I do supervise neuropsychologists at the Child Study Center, but they didn't. And so, um, you know, what my evaluation might look different from a neuropsychologist and that many of the tests overlap. They may use some tests that I don't use. I might use some tests that they don't, but I do have the school experience um, and the school component and the educational experience in terms of you know, figuring out um, what meets this child's needs and is yeah. this an appropriate educational program based on my evaluation. Absolutely. And I think that that, you know, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, pulls a little bit on this, you know, this idea of, you know, of, of independence and, you know, that which we keep, you know, we, which we keep, um, you know, kind of talking about in the in the course of this um, of this discussion, um, which is which right. is great. Um, I think just really quickly, Christine, the yeah, takeaway is that when parents read the criteria of a school district, that they need to question it mm -hmm. and not take it that it is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because if it says something like, you know, the just neuropsychologist. Like the just like the right. list, the list right. is the gospel. Right. Because yeah. a lot of districts are saying that neuro, if you're, you know, whatever you, expertise you're, you also have had to work in a school district. Right. I was just going to. A neuropsychologist. Going Who's worked right. in a school district? Right. And and you if know. you question them and you push back on that, they typically relent on that. You know, right. and especially right. that particular one, which I've seen multiple times and yeah. I've had to address. And then <clears throat> yeah, and then they have backtracked. So even though they have criteria, uh, you know, when you question it, oftentimes, especially something like that, which is completely yeah. unreasonable, um, you right. know, they right. they will uh so I just it. wanted I wanted to sneak that takeaway in before you went to your next question. No, that's perfect. Quite a conversation. And actually, the about next it. question's kind of um, you know for all of you, but um, Dr. Smaller um, you know touched on it um, when she said that you know parents tend to think of an IEE as being synonymous with a neuropsych, but an IEE is just an independent evaluation. It can encompass anything you know that you need your child, your second opinion on. So maybe um, can we talk about like what, you know, what types of evaluations are out there? What could you have your child evaluated for, you know, um, in, in this context? Uh, so it could be the psychological evaluation or a neuropsychological evaluation. And that would encompass the cognitive piece, uh, IQ, education, um, daily living skills, um, uh, evaluation for ADHD. Um, so a whole range um, of um, questions about uh, about the child. It also encompasses speech and language or communication mm -hmm. evaluation. Um, it could be a, um, a hearing evaluation. Mm -hmm. It could be a visual um, evaluation, um, a feeding evaluation, mm -hmm. uh, oral motor, um, um, any of those, uh, anything. PT. OT, right, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and assistive technology evaluation. So all of those are, um, and also um, the auditory processing evaluation. So all of those sort of are um, encompass what, um, an, you know, an independent 
educational evaluation can look like. And technically, it could also be a medical evaluation if the medical situation is considered to have an educational impact. And sometimes districts can do their own medical evaluation with a very medically complex child, and you could ask for an independent. So, right. um, psychiatric evaluation. Psychiatric. Psychiatric. Right. 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 Um, dare we touch on the FDA? That that is oh, not the FDA. Absolutely. The, <laughs> the FDA is not assessment. Right, but family. it's not an evaluation. Mm -hmm. So that's not, that is unfortunately something that we're still fighting to try and get um, an IE for. Mm -hmm. But I think um, you can have more success sometimes if you just uh, deal directly with the school district. And didn't okay. that have to do with recent case law that determined oh, yes. it, and, and it had always been considered a, a functional behavior assessment was an evaluation and you could disagree with it, but now you can't. And that's its own bailiwick in and of itself. Right. Which um, is why, you know, I think if you, if you talk directly to the school district, if you have an advocate or you talk directly to the school district, um, sometimes you can get that I know Melissa and I, if we talk to the opposing counsel, they know the, the case law, they're going to go, come on, no, you know, you're not entitled to that. Um, so that's just something I thought I'd share. Yeah, no. I just, I sort of worked my way around that recently in a, with it, with a client, just something to put out there that um, where, you know, the, the FBA was done. And again, um, it, it was, it was not uh, the most thorough of, of FBAs I'd ever seen in the district happened to have some districts have BCBAs that they contract with um, the BCBA was not the person who conducted the initial FBA and we just said, because we're having all of these disciplinary issues and behavioral issues, couldn't we also have the BCBA conduct an FBA and let's compare and wouldn't and and they agreed to it so again, you know, just trying to be a little bit creative around that new um, you know, that new, uh, the new case law that says FBA is not, um, you're not entitled to, but the, the district did relent, um, you know, in that because it just made sense. So there sometimes are resources within the district. Again, it's not independent. It was somebody from the district um, that's doing it. I haven't seen it yet, but my, my hope is that it will be more comprehensive. And, and just like that in a PPT, we, we also just got, um, an outside person, more mutually agreeable mm -hmm. to do an FBA. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an outside person to do an FBA um, in the school for, for the school because we couldn't, like you said, Melissa, you've got some kids that just are so complex. Mm -hmm. They have just so many discipline issues. We just don't know. I would like to, um, you know, kind of um, back up the, um, you know, or pull back the discussion a little bit and start, you know, for parents with, um, you know, can we talk through the process of requesting an IEE from a parent's perspective? And then, you know, because I feel like, you know, you request an IEE and then there's, you know, what happens if the district says no? Um, what happens if the district says yes, but they give you this list? What happens if the district says yes, you pick your own, and then they give you all this weird criteria? You know, so I kind of want to go through all the like the ways how to respond if you're a parent if the district says no to your IEE request, and then what to do if they don't say no, but then they make it difficult in these other ways. So um, I know that's a really really broad question, um, but you know, it's kind of like you know thinking about you know, how to break it down for parents. I wanted to try to do that. So anyone can the, take a crack the at that. First, the first thing is in order to be entitled to an IEE, the district has to have done some testing of their own. If, if you Within right. what time frame? Um, well, now it, one of the good things that came out of that case was that it's now three years. So Perfect. Um, from, since the last testing, I would say. Right. Um, the IDEA says that a child should be reevaluated every three years, right? right? 
But there is also a caveat there that says that if the parent and school district agree not to evaluate, they can waive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all had clients who have come in with, you know, it's been six years since an, an evaluation was done. Well, did you sign the waiver? I don't know. They handed me a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I wanted to, to mention that about the, um, the, 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 the district must do the testing first. Um, because if you try to get an, an outside evaluation first, they'll shoot you down right, right. away. Um, so let's say, uh, Melissa, this is for you. You request the IEE and the district says no right off the bat. What do you do? So the district can't just say no and then close the book and that's the end of it. So if the district says no, then they have to file uh, a due process hearing request um, because and they have to do it without unreasonable delay uh, is the language um, yeah. you know, of the law. So that means they can't wait six months to file for a due process hearing requests. For the most part, um, you know, in my experience, you know, within a few weeks, districts will will file this due process hearing request, and they have to prove that their evaluation was sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, so they can't just deny an IEE, and that's the end of it. So you know, they must file for that due process hearing request. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's sort of a, a request for an IEE triggers one of two things: the district either has to provide the IEE a public expense, or they have to file for a due process hearing to say that their uh, evaluation was sufficient. And I just want to all further clarify that, you know, the entitlement to the IEE, which is a procedural safeguard, you're probably the most important one, it, parents are entitled to one per of, uh, for the evaluation. So, you know, there've been times, right, when somebody gets an IE, they don't agree with the IEE either. You right. can't then go back to the district and say, well, I didn't like the IE, I don't agree with this either. Mm -hmm. um, and the district is not obligated to provide then a third evaluation at public expense. So just to clarify, you, um, you as the parent are entitled to one <laughs> IEE for every school evaluation that's done? For each evaluation. Evaluation. For okay. each evaluation. So, right. So so just to just to be clear, you know, you have your, you know, your triennial, you don't agree with it, you ask for the IEE, the district gives it to you, you have it, everything's fine. Three more years pass, you have another evaluation, the other, you know, your next triennial, you don't agree with that. I just want to clarify when you say triennial, because triennial usually consists of multiple evaluations. Mm -hmm. And so if it, it's not the, the triennial as a whole, it's, mm -hmm. it's if I disagree with the speech evaluation that occurred as part of my child's triennial, triennial. Perfect. Yes. Um, if that's, that's specific good. evaluation that I'm looking you can for. have a, an IEE for that speech, which kind of goes to what we were saying before about how the IEE is not synonymous with either the neuropsych as Dr. Smaller said, or as the triennial, which I was erroneously using it, you know, in, in uh, you know, um, interchangeably with. But that's an important point as well. To Melissa's point, when she said you're only entitled to one, that's also been misinterpreted, where some school districts will say, well, you have to choose the one out of the three that have right. were done. Mm -hmm. oh. No, 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 no. Right, it's right, right. one it's a it's one to one correspondence. Right, right, right. You, you get to disagree with the speech, the OT, the psychoed. So you know sometimes these things can get misinterpreted going down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, so and anyway, that, sorry, Melissa. What and, and Melissa, would you clarify, please? I think this is really important that nobody wants to go to a hearing over an IEE. Like, no, no, let's not do it. And what burden would the parent have to hire their own attorney and all of that? So can you say what practical advice you they should like maybe withdraw the request so that doesn't get triggered? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so, you know, again, it is, and parents can, you know, they can represent themselves at those hearings, at the due process hearings, if they choose to, um, or they can hire an attorney, and then that's an, you know, that is an additional expense, but um, sometimes what I'll try to do is, you know, we'll take a look, and, and if, you know, if there is a reasonable 
um, you know, again, as, as if there's a reasonable disagreement, so I'm, I'm truly understanding why they're looking for, um, you know, some additional information from a from an independent person, I will say, well, why don't we take a look at the list and you know why don't we try to is there some you know because again i know you get handed these lists and they're from the district so you know but a lot of times there's some very reasonable people you know, providers list. that are on that list that's a great point that i was kind of trying to go to with the other you know angle of this question which is like you get the list you know maybe you don't know anyone and maybe you're really set on this other person like you know is it like you know do you need to like ride or die on your person or you know should you you know maybe like you know bite the bullet and be like okay like i don't know any of these people but you know i've got a lot more stuff to fight about you know i want an outplacement so maybe it'd be okay if I went with one of these people, how would you kind of approach or them? even or, or even to say to the district, if you know, um, you know, I try to be collaborative with with my opposing counsel and say, can we come up with a new person that we can mutually agree, on? agree on? So yeah. maybe somebody if there's if, if maybe there's isn't somebody on the list that that we feel, you know, could we come up with somebody together mm -hmm. that could be agreeable to everyone? There are ways to try to, um, you know, try to work this out, because at the end of the day, um, you know, there are there are several really, you know, qualified, you know, people that can that can provide, you know, the, the information that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so I know it's critical and sometimes people do get very attached to a specific person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I always encourage them to open up their, you know, it, it, you know, ultimately they'll have to go to a due process hearing um the district if the district feels strongly enough about their their evaluation they'll file and they'll fight it mm -hmm. but that's a great point it's sometimes it's you know sometimes the list is not bad even if the list might not be truly you know independent you know so but to that point that if you're going to if you're going to let them file and if i'm a parent i'm not personally going pro se I, and i don't want to spend an att uh, attorney's fees on on the district proving their evaluations were appropriate. I'd rather take that money and buy my own Evaluate. private evaluation exactly. to bring back to the table. Exactly. And then if they use any of that or embrace any of it, I still have a chance to say, I'd like you to to, pay, to support this financially. I mean, that's just me. I don't know how you feel about it, Melissa, but I, I personally like having a parent go to having no, no 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 parent should should want to go to due process it's it's a it's a painful expensive but i meant especially over an iee right 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 there i mean are, over over the district's evaluation proving that it's appropriate right, right. <laughs> there just, are some districts that, that are requiring parents to withdraw with prejudice oh yeah they well i don't I'm not going to take an IEE, so I won't take an IEE at all for this. Mm -hmm. well, why don't you explain what why that don't you means? Explain that? Thank you for the for the yeah. audience. So when you ask for an IEE, and it's important that if the district says no, that it's put on prior written notice, which I'm assuming that um, Christine, you've had a, an, a discussion about what that means. It's Prior doesn't mean prior written notice doesn't mean that they're going to write you something prior to you asking. It's just just a technical term that means that they have to give you a written piece of paper saying we're denying your request. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can sometimes you'll get into negotiations with the district. They'll send you an email and say, look, we really want to just talk about this. And that's when you have the opportunity to open up about it. I have seen threatening letters sent to parents who said who where it's look you asked for an IAE we're standing behind our evaluation mm -hmm. either you withdraw your request or we're moving forward with due process which means that you'll have to hire a lawyer and pop 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 then but there are other districts that say they don't even send the threatening letter they just file for due process and then they tell the parent, well, we need to get this resolved. We need to have this so that you can't come back to us with your own evaluation and get reimbursed. So we're going to withdraw this with prejudice, which means that you don't get to have that IEE period. You can't come back and ask for it again within the time period that you're entitled to. 
if you're right. you forfeited it. Right. You were that's what it. with prejudice means. So just to clarify yeah. that specific term. It's just such a, it's not every district, but I have seen it up in, in my end of the state. And it's a very nasty bullying technique that I've seen some, some districts do. Melissa, what did you say it means? What, I, I missed what you said. No, I was just saying that, I was just clarifying that that's what the with prejudice, that's right. what you were defining what with prejudice, if you were to okay. withdraw with prejudice, oh, what yeah. that means. Right. Melissa, have you seen that? Have you run into that? that no, I think to, you know, and, and, and a couple of times I've done, you know, what Julie just recommended again, and just to reiterate, because it is, it, it can, it, it can sometimes avoid, um, you know, due process that way where a parent is actually able to go and get an independent evaluation on their own. That's not always the case. The parent yeah. can't always put that money yeah. up and, and make right. that happen. But, um, you know, if they're able to do that, and then they bring that evaluation back to the table, and the, you know, and the district considers it and some of those recommendations are implemented. And then you can request, you know, reimbursement that this is an IEE and request reimbursement. You know, again, you have to know your district and you have to know, um, you know, but I think that's also a really, it can be a really effective strategy to, um, you know, to avoid a due process hearing. No, I think that's a great tip. And, you know, and it is collaborative, you know, which, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, be collaborative with the school based team who, you know, is going to be part of our child's journey for, you know, many years. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the end of the day is that, you know, you want to, you know, you want to be collaborative as much as possible um, when it's within, you know, your ability to, to do, kind of do so. Right. Christine, if I could just following up on something Melissa said that yeah. don't, the, the one important thing is if you have the financial resources to get in a, a pipe, an outside evaluation on your own, you don't have to go to the district and say, I disagree with your evaluation. I want an IEE and go through this whole thing. You can just go and get your outside evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then when you bring it in, they have to consider it the same way they would an IEE. Mm -hmm. And then you can submit that for reimbursement. You don't have to tell them that you are going for an IEE. Mm -hmm. You can go and get the evaluation on your own if you can afford it and, and do it that way. It's just really hard for most parents to be able to afford that. I know when you're able to do it, do, that? do they reimburse for, for I, um, no, if mean, you didn't disagree with their evaluation, can you still ask for reimbursement? I don't, I'm not yes. sure. About, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. I, Melissa, have you ever, you bring them an outside evaluation? You say, look, I disagreed with, I, 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 I didn't agree with your evaluation there, there, but I went out and I got this. And now I want you to consider it. Oh, I, I didn't. I think there has to be the just the. My understanding would be that there you 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 know in order to get the re, any sort of reimbursement you know and under an IEE there would have to be a disagreement with the with the district evaluation. Yeah, I I didn't know Penny if you said that you I thought you said you didn't have to tell them you disagreed or anything just go out and That's, get it. I'm that sorry. That is the that is the the um the the laws that i've read that's the case law that's those are the things that i've read um i haven't had the nerve to put it into practice yet but um i have had parents who have gone out and gotten an evaluation after the district did theirs and then the district considered those and used that evaluation to program mm -hmm. yes. and so the parent asked for reimbursement and they got it yes um you know i the, I, I'll look it up and we'll. Oh, I I'll think there's a difference between. I think there's think a difference between. Thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, Julie. You know, I was going to say, I think the difference with, of what you just explained, I think, is that they used the evaluation and they oh. agreed with it. Right. That's yeah. different from if you you just said, you know, you brought it to them and they're like, sorry, right. you know, yeah, we but, disagree. Right. Okay. Yep. They're probably not. Right. And again, I'm not trying to question you. I'm just. No, I just no, no. I, I'm. I'm 
giving folks okay. the right information. No, totally. And, and have, you know, I mean, I've had that personal, it's where, you know, you went out and got a private evaluation, you know, before the school district was done doing their, you know, before you got into the calendar of them doing their, their own school evaluation. And then you're like, oh, look here, I did mine, you know, want to look at it. And they're like, oh yeah, maybe we'll use this instead of, you know, going through the process with ours. Um, and, um, I wanted to ask, um, kind of everyone, a sort of a question, um, do you feel like um, districts are fighting IEE requests more um, today relative to, you know, a couple years ago? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you elaborate yeah. on that? I just violated my question. I was telling my my son who's going for college interviews. I'm like, don't ask yes or no questions. Ask <laughs> questions that elicit a like a drawn out response. And I just completely violated my, um, you know, my rule. But um, can you elaborate on that? I was I saw Penny nod and I I, I started nodding because yes, I, yeah. I, I I feel like it's almost a go to it's yeah. it's almost this sort of, um, you know, a request almost triggers um, in, in, in so many cases. Um, just triggers a, a, a denial um, and and I don't know why that is is <coughs> excuse me I don't know why it's I'm seeing it so profoundly different um, than a few years ago but I mean I will say like in my own experience you know with the, with the with the grants program that um, in you know four years ago when we started. Um, we used to, I used to tell parents, like, like parents would come in and say, like, I want an outplacement, you know, and I, I want my child to go to this school. And I would say, okay, that's great. You don't have an, you know, you don't have an evaluate, go back to the district, request an IE, then come back to me with your IE recommending this, and then we'll give you the grant. We can, you know, move along, you know, and, you know, and go through the whole thing. And now, and they would do that. And the districts at the time, you know, would, by and large, a lot of them would just go ahead and do it, you know, and I think, um, and I have speculated, you know, Melissa, just kind of in answer to your, um, you know, question that you didn't ask with, is that, you know, I think it's because more students are asking for outplacement and the districts know that that is the, the route that they have to go through. So they're just denying them as a matter of course, even if that is, isn't the ultimate game, because they don't know what the ultimate end goal is. So that's because that's the truth fine. is an IEE, you know, more often than not in my, in, in my own practice is really because we want to make sure we're getting the right programming for the child. You know, yeah. it's, it's not a means it's to the an roadmap. Yeah, it's place. the roadmap. You it's know. the roadmap. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think if everyone, you know, everybody has more information. I love what Dr. Smaller said is like, it's like a second opinion, a new set of eyes mm -hmm. um, on the child. It's just beneficial for programming. So, it, you know, it's not this, um, you know, means to an end for outplacement. It's, it's you know, ultimately you need it um, if you are going to seek outplacement, but more often than not, it's just, this doesn't make sense. And if I'm, you know, if, if my child has, um, you know, this issue and, and, you know, and, and, and I, he's presenting like he might, he may actually be dyslexic and I don't agree with this literacy evaluation. I want an outside evaluation. So we make sure he's getting the right help um, in, you know, in the, in the program that he's in. So it's. Right. And many, many cases is that, you know, everybody wants to have their child educated at a neighborhood school within the neighborhood. And that is a hundred percent, that is a hundred percent correct. You know, yeah, and so, so it does come down to, we need to tweak this program. We need to add this. We need to right. have the program make a little more sense. And, and, and in most of the districts, um, I don't, I don't want to say most half of the districts will are willing to collaborate. Um, in order to, um, you know, make sure that the program makes sense for the child. So those are, um, you know, those are the good news scenarios. I have to say that as a result of the pandemic, I've had more school referrals, more 
independent educational evaluations um, in a long, you know, than I have in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that it's more 75% of schools paying for the evaluations at this it's point. It's probably because they're at a loss. They don't, they truly don't know what to do, right? So they're, they'll do, happily but, right, take right. you as, yeah. I would and imagine especially in this area, it's also there's staffing right. issues and, you know, and everyone mm -hmm. and there's pressure on that, you know, and so sometimes it's like if their staff is booked up, you know, sometimes that's a thing. What percent of your practice, um, Dr. Small, if you don't mind my asking, is, um, you know, is are these are IEEs? Just um, so it's um, I mean, it it's sort of split. 50%. So 50% is, the, um, I say therapy cases, and then the other half is evaluations. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it goes anywhere from four, three to four a month. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> and I think that you do more than most, than a lot of, um, you know, professionals. I mean, there's a, there's a group of you that, you know, are really um, dedicated to, you know, to doing this and, you know, to, to really being, um, you know, the advocates for children. And I, you know, and I commend you and, and thank you for that. Um, it is really a, a tremendous thing that, um, that you do. Um, I don't know what we're going to do when you retire, but um, you know, <laughs> I will cross that bridge when we get to it, I guess. Um, I um, had a question from the chat, which is, um, does a screening count as an evaluation? This is saying no. No, a screening is not an evaluation. Um, a screening is typically done to determine whether an evaluation is needed. Necessary, yeah. So like a reading, you know, screening, a literal, you know, right? That, that, that would be a, a screening, but not an evaluation. Right. Yeah, and usually screening is, is more in the context of, you see that a lot with OT, um, you know, occupational right. therapy, physical therapy, maybe in the related services um, or in, uh, assistive technology, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of a screen to see whether a deeper uh, evaluation is, is necessary. Mm -hmm. That's super, thank you. Um, I am, um, you know, since we started late, we're ending a little bit late, but um, I wanted to, you know, kind of um, ask the panel if um, you had any thoughts or advice for parents who are looking, who, you know, are, you know, are needed or, you know, are at this particular stage where they, they think that they need a second opinion. They think that they need another set of eyes on their child. Um, you know, how to, how to, how to proceed. What, what advice would you give to, to parents that are in this process? I think we're all afraid to go first. <laughs> Melissa, you I know I'm afraid I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I just, I, my advice is if you think it, if you have that instinct, uh, you know, I would say trust your instinct, um, you know, and, and, and request it and, and, you know, request the, uh, the IEE, request the district's criteria for qualified, you know, evaluators and start the process. Because if you're, if you're questioning, if you're having that, um, you know, those thoughts, then, then you're probably right. There should be um, a second opinion, another set of eyes on your child. That would be my advice. I agree. I mean, and, and the parent is the expert on the child. Um, and you know, in your heart, in your gut, that something is not right. And that, the, that you know, schools are very a busy place under a tremendous amount of stress, but something tells you that they're not seeing what your child needs and that you absolutely have to trust those feelings. I couldn't agree more with my, my youngest. So all three of my kids were on IEPs at one time or another. With my youngest is when I asked for an IAE, and that was my first time. My voice shook. My heart was pounding. I was terrified. But I knew that what they were saying about my daughter wasn't right. right. Well, my I guess my takeaway would be two things, um, you know, because sometimes it can be scary to ask for it, like you just said, Penny. And I always like to 
you know, you don't have to write, you don't have to ask at a PPT, you could write it separately in an email. And now prior written notice is even a separate part of many of the school districts are saying this is not a PPT issue, let's do it separately. Um, just say that you politely disagree and you want to exercise your right to an IEE. And I would always, I always like to tell parents, let's make sure that we submit diagnostic and programming questions. Diagnostic. What are the disabilities? You know, what are this, all of the suspected areas of disability? Programming questions. What components of programming must be included in my child's, to, to meet my child's um, disability? Ask very specific questions because, and again, this is one of the reasons why I, you know, how do you choose an evaluator? You want to make sure that your, 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 your recommendations are tangible and, and you can, you can literally say, okay, this is what we're asking for. And, and that there's prescriptive. Mm -hmm. This is super helpful. We can, um, I just thought of four more questions. We can go on like all night. But, um, <laughs> I would, with respect to everyone, um, I would like to thank um, attorney Petzold, attorney Gagne, um, Julie, the life skills lady, um, extraordinaire and Dr. Adrian Smaller for, um, participating in this webinar for, you know, lending your advice, your, um, your experience, um, hard earned and, um, you know, and well-earned at that, um, to share with our community of, um, you know, of parents and caregivers this evening. Um, I will, this, um, this webinar will be available on recorded, um, within a day or so. And again, thank you all so much for attending and apologies again for the technical issues. Um, have a good night, everyone. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to self. Yes. Thank you to self. Thank right? you. <laughs> all right.